Hello, my name is Hassan Sorrells, and this is the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast, episode number 34. Today, we will be covering the second book in the USA trilogy, John Dos Passos's 1919. And I read directly from 1919 by John Dos Passos, the Mariner Books edition with the introduction by E.L. Doctoro. And I quote, Joe Williams put on the secondhand suit and dropped his uniform with a cobblestone wrapped up in it off the edge of the dock into the muddy water of the basin. It was noon. There was nobody around. He felt bad when he found he didn't have the cigar box with him. Back in the shed, he found it where he'd left it. It was a box that had once held Flor de Mayo, Flor de Mayo cigars he'd bought when he was drunk in Guantanamo. In the box under the gold paper lace were Janie's high school graduation picture, a snapshot of Alec with his motorcycle, a picture with the signatures of the coach and all the players of the whole high school junior team that he was captain of all in baseball clothes, an old pink almost faded snapshot of his dad's tug, the Mary B. Sullivan, taken off the Virginia Capes with a full rig ship in tow, an undressed postcard picture of a girl named Antoinette he'd been with in Ville Franche, some safety razor blades, a postcard photo of himself, and two other guys, all gobs and white suits, token against the background of a Moorish arch in Malaga, a bunch of foreign stamps, a package of merry widows, and ten little pink and red shells he'd picked up on the beach at Santiago. With the box tucked right under his arm, feeling crummy in the baggy, civics he walked slowly out to the beacon and watched the fleet in formation steaming down the river plate the day was overcast the lean cruisers soon blurred into their trailing smoke smudges joe stopped looking at them and watched a rusty tramp come in she had a heavy list to port and you could see the hull below the water line green and slimy with weed there was a blue and white Greek flag on the stern and a dingy yellow quarantine flag halfway up the fore. A man who had come up behind him said something to Joe in Spanish. He was smiling. He was a smiling, ruddy man in blue denims and was smoking a cigar, but for some reason he made Joe feel panicky. No savvy, Joe said, and walked away and out between the warehouses into the streets back of the waterfront. He had trouble finding Maria's place. All the blocks looked so much alike. It was by the mechanical violin in the window that he recognized it. Once he got inside the stuffy anise smelling dump, he stood a long time at the bar with one hand round a sticky beer glass looking out in the street, and he could see in bright streaks through the bead curtain that hung in the door. Any minute he expected the white uniform and yellow holster of a marine to go past. Behind the bar, a yellow youth with a crooked nose leaned against the wall, looking at nothing. When Joe made up his mind, he jerked his chin up. The youth came over and craned confidentially across the bar, leaning on one hand and swabbing at the oilcloth with the rag he held in the other. The flies that had been grouped on the rings left by beer glasses on the oilcloth flew up to join the buzzing mass on the ceiling. I would like to open with a quote from the character Amerigo Bonacera from that great mafia movie of the 1970s, The Godfather. Bonacera 
and you've seen this scene before, speaking to the godfather Vito Corleone, played by Marlon Brando, in his office in the early 1950s, a dark room full of wood with cats and shadowy men in the corners, opens the film after its swell of the titular theme that you all know with, well, with these iconic words. I believe in America. America has made my fortune, and I raised my daughter in the American fashion. I gave her her freedom, but I taught her to never dishonor her family. I believe in America. In John Dos Passos' 1919, we begin to see, as we begin to see at the end of 42nd Parallel, actually we see it now in full bloom, the decline of Dos Passos' belief in America. And this reveals a larger decline, a larger separation, such as it were, between the elites who rule and the people who live. That separation, leaders, comes from a sense of betterness. And Dos Passos fully explores this concept of betterness in 1919. It is a hubristic arrogance that warps into tyrannical behavior if it's not checked with humility. The problem we've got today, of course, is that the sense of elitism has pervaded and infected most modern leaders and their leadership practices. Despasos, to his credit, despised arrogance, high-handedness, hubris, and a lack of humility that led inevitably to a willful blindness. However, and this is the tension, and you get a sense of it in 1919 when you read this book, leaders, he believed in America just as much as Amerigo Bonacera did in that office in the 1950s after an apocalyptic world war that made the Western world free. And he believed, Dos Passos did, in the American promise. John Dos Passos is a fascinating gentleman because, like many folks who saw the World War I and experienced things in World War I and then lived long enough to see the other side of World War II, he was part of the last generation of intellectual literary elites to actually believe in America and to write for Americans in the mid-20th century. However, by the time of his death in 1970, the tide had begun to perceptibly turn if you were paying attention, if you were one of those folks who was actually looking at the cultural tides. By the way, if you don't believe me, just go back and listen to our episode about Joan Dinian and what she covering <clears throat> her great book, Slouching Towards Bethlehem, and just read what she wrote about what was happening in San Francisco. And in the 1970s, in the 1960s, uh, by the time of by the time of Dos Passos's decline and death, the separation between the elite and the commoners was beginning to be defined not only by class and habits and wealth, but also by something infinitely more sinister, something we can't really put a finger on, but we know is there today. A growing doubt, a growing disbelief in the goodness and the rightness of the American people themselves and the American experience inside of the American experiment. And so today on the podcast, we are going to dig in and we are going to root out this seed of doubt, first planted in post-World War I America via John Dos Passos's 1919, the second volume in his tremendous 1,200-page work, The USA Trilogy. (music) 
back to 1919. Back to John Dos Passos' 1919. We're going to read a little excerpt from here about a gentleman named, well, a gentleman named Randolph Bourne. Randolph Bourne came as an inhabitant of this earth without the pleasure of choosing his dwelling or his career. He was a hunchback, grandson of a congregational minister, born in 1886 in Bloomfield, New Jersey. There he attended grammar school and high school. At the age of 17, he went to work as a secretary at a Morristown businessman, or to a Morristown businessman. He worked his way through Columbia, working in a pianola record factory in Newark, working as a proofreader, piano tuner, accompanist in a vocal studio in Carnegie Hall. At Columbia, he studied with John Dewey, got a traveling fellowship that took him to England, Paris, Rome, Berlin, Copenhagen, wrote a book on the Gary schools. In Europe, he heard music, a great deal of Wagner and Scheiben, and bought himself a black cape. The sparrow-like man, tiny twisted bit of flesh in a black cape, always in pain and ailing, put a pebble in his sling and hit Goliath square in the forehead with it. War, he wrote, is the health of the state. Half musician, half educational theorist, weak health and being poor and twisted in body and on bad terms with his people hadn't spoiled the world for Randolph Bourne. He was a happy man, loved demerstressing and playing Bach with his long hands that stretched so easily over the keys and pretty girls and good food and evenings of talk. When he was dying of pneumonia, a friend brought him an eggnog. Look at the yellow, it's beautiful, he kept saying as his life ebbed into delirium and fever. He was a happy man. Born seized with feverish intensity on the ideas then going around at Columbia. He picked rosy glasses out of the turgid jumble of John Dewey's teaching through which he saw clear and sharp the shining capital of reformed democracy, Wilson's new freedom. But he was too good a mathematician. He had to work the equations out, with the result that in the crazy spring of 1917 he began to get unpopular where his bread was buttered at the New Republic. For new freedom, read conscription. For democracy, win the war. For reform, safeguard the mortgage loans. For progress, civilization, education service. Buy a liberty bond. Strafe the Hun. Jail the objectors. He resigned from the New Republic. Only the Seven Arts had the nerve to publish his articles against the war. The backers of the Seven Arts took their money elsewhere. Friends didn't like to be seen with Bourne. His father wrote him begging him not to disgrace the family name. The rainbow-tinted future of reformed democracy went like a pricked soap bubble. The liberals scurried to Washington. Some of his friends pleaded with him to climb up on Schoolmaster Wilson's Sharabang. The war was great fought from the swivel chairs of Mr. Creel's bureau in Washington. He was cartooned, shadowed by the Espionage Service and the Counter Espionage Service. Taking a walk with two girlfriends at Woods Hole, he was arrested. A trunk full of manuscripts and letters was stolen from him in Connecticut, forced to the utmost, thundered Schoolmaster Wilson. He didn't live to see the big circus of the peace of Versailles or the purplish normalcy of the Ohio gang. Six weeks after the armistice, he died planning an essay on the foundations of future radicalism in America. If any man has a ghost, born has a ghost, a tiny twisted unscarred ghost in a black cloak, hopping along the grimy old brick and brownstone street still left in downtown New York, crying out in a shrill, soundless giggle, war is the health of the state. And I quote from the introduction to 1919 by E.L. Doctoro. I'm going <clears> to <throat> read a long passage from Doctoro's uh, introduction to, uh, to this great work. Um, and by the way, it's the same introduction that was printed in the 42nd parallel by, uh, by Mariner Books. 
Um, by the way, that was me taking a sip of water to slake my throat on this podcast episode today covering John Dos Passos. And so I quote from the introduction to 1919 by E.L. Doctorow. In fact, this is doctoral writing, the pervading vision of USA is of people dominated by institutions, which is to say, trapped in history. The novel is without a hero. We are given narratives of the lives of a dozen men and women. Joe Williams, a seaman, Mac, a typesetter, J. Ward Morehouse, a public relations man, Eleanor Stoddard, a stage designer, Dick Savage, a Harvard graduate and World War I ambulance driver, Charlie Anderson, a wartime air ace inventor and inventor, Margot Dowling, an actress, Ben Compton, a union organizer, and so on, and watch three decades pass through them as they reach their prime and then age and flounder, either to die or simply to disappear, or, with one or two exceptions, to end in moral defeat. Living below the headlines, they're presented as ordinaries. Their lives can intersect. They can sometimes be charming or sympathetic, but they are always seen from above, as in satire, and all their irresolution, self-deceit, and haplessness, and their failure to find empowerment in love or social rebellion is unconsoled by the moral structure of a plot. USA has no plot, only the movement forward of its multiple narratives under the presiding circumstances of history. Close quote. Oh, wait, not close quote. (laughs) This is why we love listening to the podcast, right? There's more from Doctoro. The circumstances themselves are occasionally flashed to us by means of the so-called newsreels that interrupt the text with actual headlines from newspapers of the time, fragments of news stories, advertising slogans, and popular song lyrics all popping up in a rat tat fashion like momentary garish illuminations as for fireworks of the American landscape. Early readers were dazzled, as they should have been, by these collages. Now, close quote. When people are dominated and controlled by faceless institutions, they can indeed begin to believe, as Doctoro has pointed out here in the introduction, um, they can begin to believe that their lives do not matter. The entire narrative of the 20th century, though, is one of individual people, I believe, fundamentally waking up to the idea that the minutia of their lives matters to somebody somewhere other than just the people in their immediate household. If you don't believe me, just look at the crowds that are on social media. And with the gatekeepers of culture and taste, the two behavioral horns upon which many people in the past were kept trapped Uh, or kept corralled, uh, with those gatekeepers of culture and taste tearing up the gates, burning them down, and then running gleefully in the open fields, there are now very few areas which serve to bind ordinary people together, much less corral them into one way of thinking. Now, we despise the gatekeepers, and we despise the gates Our natural inclination, our natural tendency is to buck up against boundaries, to kick, such as has been said in a much older book, against the pricks. But the pricks and the gates and the guardrails and whatever other whatever other symbolistic or symbology you want to use, whatever other terms you want to use to sort of have dominated in your mind this idea of corralling people in. Whatever terms it is you want to use to corral the masses, to, to make them go and do stuff, to make them go and think stuff, to put them in a box, whether that box is the size of a social media account, the size of the mobile phone upon which that social media account sits, or the box that I'm sitting in right now, either in your head, or if you're watching this on the pot, on the YouTube channel, on whatever device you may be watching it on. We reject the boundaries of that box. But that box, those boundaries, however you define them, they provide necessary meaning. That's why human beings continue to construct them. History without meaning, to Doc Toro's point, history without meaning has no mattering for people. And history without meaning, history without a box, is merely just stuff happening. 
whether your name is Randolph Bourne, your name is Ben Compton, or your name is, well, Hassan Sorrells. These boxes, these boundaries, yes, they are places we can struggle against. Yes, they are places we can push against. And leaders, you have to know that what you fundamentally do <clears throat> in the vacuum of history, the role you provide, and it is a fundamental role, the role you provide is the role of the constructor of the box, the constructor of the corral, the maker of the space, but also you also need to lead the people into understanding why they need to go into the space and provide them meaning that is legitimate and mattering that goes beyond existential for how they should live their lives as they kick against the boundaries. Back to the book, back to 1919 by John Dos Passos. Once again, this is the Mariner Books Edition by Houghton Mifflin Company. I'm holding it up on the video. You can go and check it out if you would like. Um, I strongly recommend picking this up. You can pick it up as a three-pack um, with um, with uh, 42nd Parallel and The Big Money, which we're going to cover on our last podcast um, about... Uh, about uh, about this uh, about this uh, this trilogy, and again, each one of these has the same forward in it by E. L. Doc Toro. So, uh, definitely something to note. Um, I don't know how Mariner Books decided to make made that decision. I don't know why they had um, one introduction for all three of the books. I, I actually think each book stands alone, um, and but also works together, and and so I think they had to make an editorial an editorial decision here, uh, just as we have made an editorial decision because twelve hundred pages is just too much to cover on the podcast, um, and so <clears throat> we always believe in you going out and getting a book, right? You going out and reading a book, and this is. This is fundamentally a book for our social media saturated TikTok driven 30 second, 30 second uh, hummingbird attention, uh, you know, time span, uh, time frame of attention, um, society and culture right now. It's perfect actually for our era. And so go pick up the Mariner Books edition. If you don't own any other fictional books as a leader, um, I would strongly recommend owning those owning these uh and it, and it looks really good by the way on your bookshelf um as well back to the book back to 1919 as i was saying by john dos passos the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles the old people were Jews, but at school, Benny always said, no, he wasn't a Jew. He was an American because he'd been born in Brooklyn and lived at 2531 25th Avenue in Flatbush, and they owned their home. The teacher in the seventh grade said he squinted and sent him home with a note, so Pop took an afternoon off from the jewelry store where he worked with a lens in his right eye, repairing watches, to take Benny to an optician who put drops in his eyes and made him read little teeny letters on a white card. Pop seemed tickled when the optician said Benny had to wear glasses. Vachmika's eyes takes after this old man, he said, and patted his cheek. The steel eyeglasses were heavy on Benny's nose and cut him, cut into him from behind the ears. It made him feel funny to have Pop telling the optician that a boy with glasses wouldn't be a bum and a baseball player like Sam and Isidore, but would attend to his studies and be a lawyer and a scholar like the men of old. A rabbi, maybe, said the optician, but Pop said rabbis were loafers and lived on the blood of the poor. And he and the old woman still ate kosher and kept the Sabbath like their fathers, but synagogue and the rabbis? He made a spitting sound <laughs> with his lips. The optician laughed and said, as for himself, he was a free thinker, but religion was good for the common people. When they got home, Mama said the glasses made Benny look awful old. Sam and Izzy yelled, hello, four eyes, when they came in for selling papers. But at school next day, they told the other fads it was a state's prison offense to roughhouse a feller for glasses. Once he had the glasses, Benny got to be very good at his lessons. 
In high school, he made the debating team. When he was 13, Pop had a long illness and had to give up work for a year. They lost the house that was almost paid for and went to live in a flat on Myrtle Avenue. Benny got work in a drugstore evenings. Sam and Izzy left home. Sam to work in a furrier's in Newark. Izzy had gotten to loafing in pool parlors, so Pop threw him out. He'd always been a good athlete and palled around with an Irishman named Pug Riley who was going to get him into the ring. Mama cried and Pop forbade any of the kids to mention his name. Still, they all, they all knew that Gladys, the oldest one, who was working as a stenographer over Manhattan, sent Izzy a $5 bill now and then. Benny looked much older than he was and hardly ever thought of anything except making money so the old people could have a house of their own again. When he grew up, he'd be a lawyer and a businessman and make a pile quick so the Gladys could quit work and get married and the old people could buy a big house and live in the country. Mama used to tell him about how when she was a young maiden in the old country, they used to go into the woods after strawberries and mushrooms and stop by a farmhouse and drink milk, all warm and foamy from the cow. Benny was going to get rich and take them all out in the country for a trip to a summer resort. When Pop was well enough to work again, he rented half a two-family house in Flatbush, where at least they'd be away from the noise of the elevated. The same year, Benny graduated from high school and won a prize for an essay on the American government. He'd gotten very tall and thin and had terrible headaches. The old people said he'd outgrown himself and took him to see Dr. Cohen, who lived on the same block but had his offices downtown near Borough Hall. The doctor said he'd have to give up night work and studying too hard. What he needed was something that would keep him outdoors and develop his body. All work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, he said, scratching the grizzled beard under his chin. Benny said he had to make some money this summer because he wanted to go to New York University in the fall. Dr. Cohen said he ought to eat plenty of milk dishes and fresh eggs and go somewhere where he could be out in the sun and take it easy all summer. He charged two dollars. Walking home, the old man kept striking his forehead with the flat of his hand and saying he was a failure. Thirty years he had worked in America, and now he was a sick old man, all used up, and couldn't provide for his children. Mama cried. Gladys told them not to be silly. Benny was a clever boy and a bright student, and what was the use of all his book learning if he couldn't think up of some way to get a job in the country? Benny went to bed without saying anything. If you want to make everyone happy, don't be a leader. Sell ice cream. Steve Jobs knew something that little Benny Compton, little Benny Compton with the glasses, is about to learn um, in, um, in 1919 in that passage we just read by John Dos Passos. And it's not going to be something he's going to learn about class struggles. It's not going to be about being Jewish in Brooklyn or even about the vagaries of ethnic decision-making in America. It's not going to be the difference about the difference between living in the city and living in the country. Benny Compton is about to learn about being a leader. He's about to learn that you can follow every rule, every proscription, and every prescription, and you can do what you're told. You can walk the line. You can face your fears. And in the end... Misfortune, disappointment, and struggle may still be all that the Old Testament God you don't follow anymore allows you to reap from the ground. You may support your people. You may do the right things, advocate in all the right ways, and you may still lose your job. You may still be fired. You may have the courage of your convictions. You may know and understand and be familiar and comfortable with the rightness of your ethics. You may have, indeed, the strength of the long position, not the short one. And you may still be ignored, demeaned, debased, or even outright abused. Leaders need to know what Ben Compton is about to learn in his long struggle through America you're not owed an easy life of leadership. 
You are not owed a riskless life with no struggle, pain, no disappointment, and no displeasure. You're also about to learn, or leaders, you should learn what Ben is about to learn, that doing the right thing is always the right thing, regardless of the cost. But doing the right thing isn't always going to be comfortable, and it isn't going to be pleasant, and it isn't fundamentally always going to make you happy. Just look at Benny's father. Leadership doesn't equate to happiness. But it does equate to something that Benny's father couldn't articulate to Benny and that many mentors can't articulate to leaders. But we're going to try on this podcast. Leadership does equate to freedom. Not the freedom from something, but the freedom to do something. And that is a distinction with the difference that matters in our very comfortable and our very materially abundant 21st century. Back to the book, back to 1919. Let's, let's visit another character. Let's, um, let's look at someone else's life, another snapshot. And uh, see what we can draw from that snapshot of that life from 1919 by John Dos Passos, the Mariner Books edition. Little Evelyn and Arjet and Laid and Gogo lived on the top floor of a yellow brick house on the North Shore Drive. Arget and Laid were little Evelyn's sisters. Gogo was her little brother, littler than Evelyn. He had such nice blue eyes, but Miss Matilda had horrid blue eyes. On the floor below was Dr. Hutchinson's study, where your father wasn't to be disturbed, and dear mother's room, where she stayed all morning, painting dressed in lavender smock. On the ground floor was the drawing room and the dining room where parishioners came and little children must be seen and not heard. And at dinner time, you could smell good things to eat and hear knives and forks and tinkly company voices and your father's booming scary voice when your father's voice was going. All the company voices were quiet. Your father was Dr. Hutchins, but our father art in heaven. When your father stood beside the bed at night to see that little girls said their prayers, Evelyn would close her eyes tight and be scared. It was only when she hopped into bed and snuggled way down so that the covers were right across her nose that she felt cozy. George was a dear, although Adelaide and Margaret teased him and said he was their assistant like Mr. Blessington was father's assistant. George always caught things first and then they all had them. It was lovely when they had the measles and the mumps all at once. They stayed in bed and had hyacinths and pots and guinea pigs and dear mother used to come up and read the jungle book and do funny pictures and your father would come up and make funny bird beaks that opened up out of paper and tell stories he made up right out of his head and dear mother said he had said prayers for you children in church and that made them feel fine and grown up. When they were all up and playing in the nursery, George caught something again and had pneumonia on account of getting cold in his chest. And your father was very solemn and said not to grieve if God called little brother away. But God brought little George back to them, even though he was delicate after that and had to wear glasses. And when dear mother let Evelyn help bathe him because Miss Matilda was having the measles too, Evelyn noticed he had something funny there where she didn't have anything. She asked dear mother if it was a mump, but dear mother scolded her and said she was a vulgar little girl to have looked. Hush, child, don't ask questions. Evelyn got all red and all over and cried, and Adelaide and Margaret wouldn't speak to her for days on account of her being a vulgar little girl. Summers, they all went to Maine with Miss Matilda in a drawing room. George and Evelyn slept in the upper and Adelaide and Margaret slept in the lower 
Miss Matilda was train sick and didn't close her eyes all night on the sofa opposite. The train went rumble bump, chug, 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 and the trees and the houses ran by, the front ones fast and those way off very slow, and at night the engine wailed and the children couldn't make out why the strong, nice, tall conductor was so nice to Miss Matilda, who was so hateful and train sick. Maine smelt all woodsy, and mother and father were there to meet them, and they all put on khaki jumpers and went camping with father and the guides. It was Evelyn who learned to swim quicker than anybody. observations here about Evelyn and maybe a few other ideas that I have after that little jog through Dos Passos's snapshot of little Evelyn Hutchins born in Chicago uh, very waspy upbringing there's some there's an observation here but I want to open up with a quote from someone who's who was not waspy <laughs> Not a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant by any stretch of the imagination. Um, from Albert Einstein in 1945, a quote that has stuck with me for many, many years. The release of atomic power has changed everything except our way of thinking. The solution to this problem lies in the heart of mankind. If only I had known, I should have become a watchmaker. This quote is in Watchmen, actually. Alan Moore references it um, after the chapter, the titular, one of the titular chapters in the graphic novel Watchmen, um, when Dr. Manhattan is on Mars and is having an existential crisis, kind of the type that Evelyn is going to have here upcoming in the next few years because of the nature of how she is being made. Evelyn may not know how to articulate these questions, but leaders need to know how to say them and articulate them and think about them. And so just here's a few thoughts for you. Is the world made or do people make the world through the effectual working out of their own personal wills? Is the future guaranteed or has it already been determined what we are allowed to be by the nature of history? circumstances, class structure, or other factors outside of our individual control. Questions like these that now haunt the steps of postmodern man, postmodern leaders, like a daunting shadow. Remember Peter Pan's shadow that never really fully quite go away. These questions birthed the nihilism that, and the existential dread that nests underneath Dos Passos's writing and thinking about these characters. And, of course, his development as a young intellectual in the early 20th century. Birthed in the mind of Nietzsche originally and fully realized right now in the palm of all of our collective class struggling hands with our mobile phones and social media access, these existential crises live under and around and in between everything Dos Passos claims to represent in his writing about the lives of the people in the USA. But don't believe me. From E.L. Doctoro, quoting Jean-Paul Sartre, if you don't know who that is, you might want to go look him up, in 1938. Uh, Sartre loved, by the way, USA Trilogy. But again, don't let me tell you. Let's see what Doc Toro has to say. And I quote, for Jean-Paul Sartre, writing in 1938, it was exactly the novel's refusal to redeem its characters that he found its greatness. Their lives are reported, their feelings and utterances put forth, says Sartre, in the style of, quote, a statement to the press, unquote. And we, the readers, accumulate endless catalogs of individual sensory adventures from the outside right up to the moment the character disappears or dies and is dissolved in the collective consciousness. 
And to what purpose all those feelings and all that adventure? What is the individual life against history? Quote, the pressure exerted by a gas on the walls of its container does not depend upon the individual histories of the molecules composing it, says the French existential philosopher. Okay. And yet, the solution to the problems that Sartre loved, the existential problems that he thought were just thought exercises, that were defined in prose by Dos Passos in the USA trilogy, can't be left alone. And they wouldn't be left alone in the long course of the 20th century. They would be relentlessly explored by writers and intellectuals from Gore Vidal to Joan Didion, by politicians and policymakers from Henry Kissinger all the way to Bill Clinton, and entertainers and pundits from Merv Griffin all the way to Rush Limbaugh. What is an individual life against history? What does it mean to be trapped by historical forces that you had no personal hand in creating? What does it mean to make the world? Who gets to decide? Where will they lead you? The answers to these questions lie buried deeply and querulously in the human heart. Albert Einstein knew this. And leaders have to decide if they want to start answering these questions for their teams, their communities, their cultures, and their organizations. And they have to decide how loudly and vociferously and insistently and consistently they want to answer these questions. But they have to articulate them first. Otherwise, leaders, it might be a really good idea for you to take up a career in the demanding and shrinking field of watchmaking. So, as I ask at the end of every single one of these episodes, particularly these standalone ones that seem like longer shorts episodes where we don't really have a guest because either A, we can't get one, or B, we can't get one, or C, we can't get one. So we just kind of lay it out here, right? These are structured more like stories or maybe even short version, short form version college lectures, right? By the way, your average college lecture is usually about an hour and a half. Um, we try to make it shorter. But what are we to learn about staying on the path from John Dos Passos's second book in his three-volume trilogy, 1919? What are we to learn from examining these people's lives, right? The Evelyn Hutchins and the Joe Williams and the Ben Comptons and the Randolph Bournes and, and, and all those folks. What are we to learn? What are we to glean from their existences? What did Dos Passos want us to learn well, I think the biggest thing that we can learn as leaders and that we can actually directly apply is this idea that leadership can solve almost any crisis and problem, even the most existential, existentially damning ones. By the way, um, if you've made it this far into the podcast um, and you're a person who listens to me on the regular, I want to thank you for your feedback. Um, you know, uh, a couple of listeners have, have reached out to me and have said, and subscribers have, listened, have reached out to me and they've said, you know, your podcast really bends my brain. It, it encourages me to think about things in a different way or, hey, those books that you read, they're really deep and complicated. Thank you for, you know, <laughs> going out there and making the complex understandable. Um, so I'm going to bend your brain a little bit more and hopefully I'm going to make the complex a little bit more understandable at the end of this one because 1919 is a hard book to get around. Um, 
just like just like any second book or second movie in a trilogy a second thing in a number of three things it it binds the first thing and the third thing together it's the meat inside of the sandwich and no one comes to a sandwich for the bread they come there for the well for the meat for the whole thing together and so this unremarked upon second book in USA Trilogy does have something to offer us as leaders. And it, there are some meaty things in here. There are some meaty things in here. However, well, the lives of Evelyn Hutchins and Joe Williams and Ben Compton, they may fail the test of how to apply effective moral force, but they do, they do give us some insight into how to navigate a fractious and ever more demanding 21st century where all of the old ills that haunted them, the social strifes and the vagaries of the human heart remain stoically and persistently undefeated. The first thing is that leaders must believe in something. Now, for me and my part, this is why we do the podcast, I Believe in America. I'm like Amerigo Bonacera. I do believe in America, and I am raising my children in an American fashion. And no, I am, I am not going to the Godfather for anything. <laughs> I do believe in America. But you've got to believe in something. And you've got to be able to articulate that belief if you're a leader. What exactly do you believe in? Why exactly are you seeking to lead? What do you want to accomplish? Why are you here? If you're just here to populate a seat and establish a sinecure and to never be doubted, well, then you're probably not for us. We don't want to follow you if you don't know why you're here or if why you're here is thin. We're looking for thick motive. We're looking for you to think about it. We're looking for you to have made a decision about what you're doing before we showed up. Leaders believe in something. The second thing that 1919 shows us quite clearly is that there's more than just politics in the world. Um, are our lives political? Yes, perhaps. But there's more than just that. And we explore this in the first episode of our three uh, of our trilogy here, focused around um, the um, focused around John Dos Passos's USA trilogy, our own trilogy of podcasts here. There's more than just politics in the world. The world is full of other things. The world is full of trauma and defeat and disappointment. But the world is also full of gladness and light and hope. Um, we need to be able to recognize those other things as leaders. We need to focus sometimes on those other things. And even sometimes we need to lead on those other things as leaders. The next thing we find from 1919 is a thing that's not so pleasant. Actually, the next two things probably aren't so pleasant. But... They are critical and they are important and, and I believe fundamental, particularly in our era where everyone wants to appear to be happy, but no one really knows how to be happy. Leadership is not designed to make you happy. The world is not designed to make you happy as a leader. Um, does this mean that you should walk around being down in the mouth all the time and being serious and stoic? No, if that's not your personality, go be happy. <laughs> Like, be genuinely content. Be genuinely happy. But if it is your personality, own it. Own the stoicism. Own the, uh, the, the ill humor, such as it may be. Make it part of your DNA as a leader. But realize that your demeanor and the outcomes of your circumstances are disconnected. Do they impact others? Do they impact how others show up? Sure. Yes, absolutely but they also don't. We don't want to say it out loud because we do live in a motivational speaking world and we do live in a motivationally driven universe, particularly in the United States post-1950, where we're told if you just put a smile on, your mood will improve. I mean, we've got scientific studies that back up this idea. If you just put a smile on, your mood will improve. If you just put a smile on, everything will be fine. If you just put a smile on, you may be deluding yourself. Sometimes it's okay to stop putting the smile on. And the circumstances of leadership are not always going to generate a smile for you. So, for instance, if you have to fire 
people on your team, there's not going to be anything happy about that. Can you smile while you do it? Sure. But I wouldn't recommend it. Leadership is not designed to make you happy as the leader. Finally, from 1919, we'll turn the corner here, we'll wrap up. We are in the midst of massive existential strife and a sea change that is happening in the West. Part of this is driven by philosophical ideals that came out of Nietzsche, who we explored in a previous podcast. Uh, Joan Didion tracked a lot of this, who we talked about in a previous podcast. And, of course, Jack Kerouac uh, documented a lot of this in On the Road, which we also talked about in a previous podcast. So those are three episodes for you to go back and listen to, um, particularly our On the Road episode with our guest, Ryan Stout. Uh, We really got into some interesting ideas there. But the fact of the matter is, existential dread is a is so much a part of the blood is so much in the bloodstream of western man that we don't even think about it anymore heck i don't even think about it anymore and i know for sure you don't this idea that there are unanswerable questions and we just need to live with existential strife this is a 20th century industrial revolution concept that has been foisted upon us by the heretical intellectuals of the 19th century who were wrestling with a world of no God, at least they thought no God, and uh, that was being defined by Darwin and Nietzsche and Freud. Now, it's going to take a long time to tear all that down because you're talking about shifting worldviews, and that's part of what this podcast is about, shifting worldviews, uh, shifting a worldview from an existential one to a cosmic worldview. But leaders have a responsibility to light the way for their followers out of the existential morass, not of their followers' individual lives, but of life itself. Let me repeat that. That way I know you heard me. Leaders have a responsibility to light the way for their followers out of the existential morass of life. Period. How you do that, the tools you use, the channels you use to do that leadership, the words you pick, the ideas you choose to promote, all have to be about leading people towards a different world view and doing it intentionally. Maybe sometimes doing it with a smile on your face, but doing it every step of the way. Why are we here? What are we doing? Where are we going? These are existential questions. They're not just questions of location. They're not just questions of identity. They're not just questions of meaning. They are questions of, well, existential syllogisms. They exist for leaders to be able to build boundaries, to build corrals, and of course to be gatekeepers and taste makers. So, leaders, light the way for your followers. Understand that this will not make you happy all the time and be okay with that. Know that there's more than just politics in the world and, you know, (laughs) take heart in that. And of course, believe in something deeply and heart-wrenchingly. And then you will have success not only in 2022, but a hundred years from now. And well, as I always say, that's it for me. Well, if you liked that video, you should check out more by subscribing to the Leadership Lessons from the Great Books podcast playlist here on the HSCT Publishing YouTube channel. You can also get a copy of my third book, 12 Rules for Leaders, The Foundation for Intentional Leadership, co-written with Bradley Madigan. Check that out on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and everywhere where you get ebooks today. And thanks.